Jeff Ogilvy survives wing foot. Now the moment Aaron Badley has waited. Curry Webb is the five-time Australian Open champion. Golf at its best by one of the best in golf, Peter Thompson. Stand in front of a crowd like this today and win the PGA Championship is pretty special. He's done it at last. Greg Norman. Jones gets his name on the Stonehaven Cup. Leash been to 11 under. Now we've got a new leader, kids. Here it is, Adam Scott. A life changer. Coming up next, you have unrestricted access to golf across Australia and the world. Thanks to Golf Australia, we're going Inside the Ropes. G'day everybody, welcome to Inside the Robes, yet again episode number 25, great to have you with us after another great week, hopefully you've hit a few long and straight, made a couple of putts since we were last here, uh, we've got a load to get through on the show today, long running interview that's been done a couple of days ago with Bruce Devlin, our road to the open, one of the giants of Australian golf, uh, Blakey Hazy and Clayton sat down with Bruce a week or two ago and had a long chat with him about his career in golf and uh, it has covered and spanned huge, huge distances. It's going to be great to sit back and have a listen to that today. The complete other end of the spectrum, we've got a young fella joining us who's become the youngest club champion in the history of the Australian Golf Club. What a story young Thomas Eaton's got to tell us. We'll catch up with him very, very shortly. There's a lot of other bits and pieces to get through on today's show. Mark Hayes is a little bit croaky today, and there's a good reason for that. Hello, Hazy. Hello, Murray. Oh, yeah. We'll have a listen to that. Yeah, it's a bit, bit gravelly today. Very I, sexy. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, Blakey. Uh, have had the honour and privilege of watching the Oils a couple of times in the past week, and I might have belted out a couple of tunes alongside Peter Garrett last night. Impossible so, not to, mate. Uh, I just, look, we don't want to talk about music too much on this, but what a treat. 40 years on, rocking as as well as I ever have, and they're better than they ever were. And I'm just, I, I'm not apologising for my voice because I loved every second of it. Oh, uh, there on Monday night at the Bu- Music Bowl, Blakey, good to see you. Uh, and it was awesome. I'm really worried, boys, because uh, I've only waited 35 years to see them again. <laughs> right. And I've got a ticket for next week. I've asked Hazy, I was texting Hazy the other day, <laughs> how did the show go? And then I pick up the paper this morning, and Jim Mogany, the guitarist, has done his hamstring. <laughs> Fell over the on show's the, in danger of the, being off. The second yeah. encore last it slipped over on some oil he, or something. Fell over at the start of the first encore. I just thought it was, you know, he's just sitting down. But, yeah, no, it's worse than we first thought. So, Blakey's on edge a bit this I'm morning. I'm very on edge. I mean, surely they can get him up to, you know, <laughs> sit, sit in a chair. And put a bench, <laughs> bench stool down or just let him sit there for the show. He doesn't do much anyway. I couldn't but, believe it. I was just, you know. I don't think your two chords on the old uh, Stratocaster are going to get you through, Blakey. No, I don't think I can do Jeez, it. I, on the air guitar, I might. They are in cracking form. I was, I know when I, but the Jezebels were there. I love the Jezebels, and they were their middle support act on Monday night. And they, as they signed up for their last song, the lead singer of the Jezebels said, uh, it's been great to be here, great to be touring with the Oils, and it's really depressing that they are still the best <laughs> band in Australia. And I'll tell you what, it's hard to argue. They are in ripping nick. Uh, they, I've seen them a few times, and they used to, I think, rely on guitars and blowing you away with noise. And now they actually sound better. It's unbelievable to think that in 2017, but they have got it all going on. It sounds like the raw nature of a live concert with the benefits of a, a studio. That Their sound is unbelievable. How good is Rob Hurst? Uh, he's the man. He's in the greatest form. He's in as good a form now as he's ever been in. The man, Rob he's Hurst. He's still hitting the drums like, he, you know, there's no tomorrow. Best ever. Yeah. We better, we better stop this or we'll right get a music interview. Right. right. Thomas Eaton's not too far away from joining us. Uh, but before that, we got a lot of little bits and pieces. No massive news around the world of golf other than some huge results. We'll have a chat about Justin Rose in a moment. But we weighed into um, you know the return of Tiger last week, and we talked about that on the show. Well, he hasn't um, just reserved the comeback to um, what he might be able to do on the golf course. He's weighed into one of the big political um, debates and disputes in the world of golf, Blake, in... He's made a comment about the ball. To my knowledge, that's the first time he's ever said anything like this. Uh, I did read an interview the other day where, or a, a journo's comment piece where it said that about 10, 15 years ago, he said that it wouldn't really hurt him. This is when he was at his peak. Uh, it wouldn't hurt him if they wound the ball back. Of course, that's become a bigger issue over time, Hazy. And I think Hazy was looking at some... Uh, stats this week from Lin Yu Shin, the, the young Chinese boy who won the Asia Pacific Amateur last week, which he might talk about soon, just about ball speed off the club and stuff like that. I did, Andy, I did look up the uh, driving distance stats for US PGA Tour 
last year. 317 yards was the top one, Rory McIlroy. 314 the year before, 315 the year before that. If you go back to 2000, it was 301. So on the surface, that doesn't sound like a lot. I think if you ask certain people in the industry about it, they'd say that a lot of those might be three woods off the tee yeah, and stuff prop, like that. Yeah, they yeah. don't get measured if they miss the fairway. They don't tend to measure. I'm not sure if they measure every single drive you know on every like, single hole. You know what you'd like to have measured? Fairways hit with the driver. Yeah. Just fairways hit with the driver. I reckon that will give you... Mm. Because not the big miss, but when they do flush it and it goes the where it's intended to go with these big... Bo- I reckon their big balls are significantly longer now than the big drives from you know 15 years ago. Well, as we've been yes. speaking about the last few weeks, the, the technology, because I keep bringing up bifurcation and why it could actually work, is that the top end of town gets we've the big benefits. We've missed bifurcation about six weeks since yeah, you've dropped yeah, that. I know. Yeah. I, I, feel, I feel sort of dirty having not mentioned it. Yeah, well, but, no. Anyway, it's it's the top end of town, the guys who really have the high club head speed who get the big advantage. It's not quite exponential, but it is. The far, harder you swing, the more advantage you get out of the ball. So there's a, half the field who don't get the benefits that the, the Woodlands, etc., get out of all this stuff, the Bubba Watson uh, type swingers who really get down through it hard. So well, Tell us about the young Chinese, the data you brought to the table regarding this young Chinese kid. This is extraordinary to me because we mentioned him last week, Lin Yu Shin, the winner of the... Uh, Asia Pacific Amateur Championship in Wellington. Uh, he signed up to play the Australian Open, which is absolutely magnificent. Can't wait to see him, yeah, along great. with Min Wu Lee and a handful of other great um, amateurs, including the guy who was runner up in that Japanese Open, Andy, which is uh, fantastic to have him here as a jet, apparently. But back to you, Shin, and this ball speed. He posted something on social media this week and he said his ball exit speed was 190.3, I think, from memory, <laughs> miles, miles miles per hour. I thought, I thought, geez, that sounds high. And I went and checked the, some stats. Very unlike me, Blakey, I know. But I went and actually <laughs> checked some stats. And Bubba Watson and Tony Finnow, who are probably two of the biggest renowned hitters on the PGA Tour who are active at the moment, uh, were just a tick over 180. And Gary Woodland was 178. So he's 12 to 15 miles an hour faster than the guys we consider to be the long knockers out on tour. That's so this is a 17-year-old left-handed amateur from China. I'm telling you, you've got to get to the Australian to see this kid play. He, he, he's not going to win, but by jeez, if, if he makes the cut, he'll, he'll make a lot of people happy just watching him on the weekend. So that's three uh, three big names, Andy. Now, Nicholas Player and Woods are all, are all in the camp that says slow down the ball. Uh, I would just throw into the, the picture that the club heads have been allowed to get very big. Mm. Uh, metal club heads as well. I think that's a factor because they can swing harder at the ball, especially the good athletic players. And I also need to include there that the players are more athletes oh, than yeah. they used to be. So I think the combination of those three things, you know, the problem is it's going to ruin all the old courses or it already is starting to make all the old courses redundant. So please do something, and authorities. I, and I'm not about... Uh potting the ball manufacturers they're just doing what formula one race teams do until the rules change yeah. and, and they'll continue to provide awesome technology if the rules change and if we have bifurcation you know there'll be two different hot balls but you know it's not about potting them i want to make it clear we're not potting titleist and callaway and all those guys it's it's just you know we do need to do exactly what blakey said and make keep the courses relevant for those guys who have the huge club head speed i'm interested in tiger coming out now i mean mortality setting in for tiger in terms of golf so he's now he can't get it out there with the the bombers the way that he probably could once upon a time so i'm not saying it's self-interest but Mm. it is interesting that he's got a different perspective about it now than he would have had, say, 15 years ago. It would be really helpful in this um, debate if people like Dustin Johnson and Rory McIlroy and Barber and Kepka, if these guys came out and said it while they're at their peak of their power, while they've got the brands on their head, mm. and you know they are ambassadors for the companies that are making these balls that are pushing the limits, they're, not gonna, they're probably not going to do it because they're duty-bound Probably not to, but it'd be enormously helpful if they did come out while they were, you know, striping it uh, and say, listen, this something does need to be done about I this. agree, but Kepka sort of almost surreptitiously said it at Aaron Hills with two three woods, didn't he? We did. Wacking I mean, up 360, yeah. You know, it's, 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 I think it's beyond the pale, to be honest. I think it's it's reached the point. And we, we keep saying this, and it's interesting to bring out stats like Yushin and you just see what the next generation could potentially do with the right training, as Blakey says. Uh, sky's the limit, and the courses 
as opposed to my good mate Brandel's uh, thinking, we, they cannot be 8,500 yards to contain them. They won't, that won't contain them in 10 years. So do you think they'll do anything about the ball? Uh, well, interestingly enough, at the Asia Pacific Amateur Championship, um, I asked the new chairman, Fred Ridley, of Augusta National, whether he would consider uh, having special Augusta rules so that they could play the Masters with a control ball to keep the course practical. And he answered the question, you know, we have great faith in the governing bodies and da 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 da, da exactly what you'd expect him to say. But Martin Slumbers, the chief executive of the RNA, actually picked it up without being uh, asked, specifically yeah. asked. And he actually, not in as many words, but he said, you know, we have got a careful eye on it. The stats are out. And I thought, oh, God, here we go. But then he actually did say, um, you know, we do need to keep tabs on the top end of the game to make it all playable for everyone. So that was the first hint to me of possible bifurcation down the track. What do you think, Blakey? Uh, well, Augusta can, can change the ball. They can do what they like. Uh, they're also looking at putting the 13th tee back, which is one of the great, you know, probably the greatest par five in the world in my book. Uh, I think that they'll have to do something. They'll be forced to do something. Not, not Augusta. I think the authorities will end up being forced to do something. The same as cricket is just about to uh, limit the size of the bats because they let that one get out of control as well. In, in mm. the end, you, you've got to protect the integrity of your, your game. And you don't want... I mean, we want to see people hitting the ball far. I mean, wouldn't matter what ball you gave Dustin Johnson, he, he hit a, a long way. Uh, but you just want to protect the course. And you don't want to see guys just playing chip and putt, no, you know, you wedge, don't, you know no. drive and wedge all the time. No, not at all. What you, what you don't want to see is Dustin Johnson and Nick O'Hearn standing on a long course on the first tee and Dustin Johnson effectively playing a par 68 mm. and Nick O'Hearn playing a par 72. Because there's not a par five in modern golf that Dustin Johnson can't get home in two. Yep. And that's credit to him and his physicality and his training and everything else he's put into it. I know that. And he, you know, Nick O'Hearn, sorry, Nick, but, you know, you, you're not that long knocker. He, he would he would say that. Um, but that's not what we want to see. We don't want to get to the point where it's like tennis and we've got five guys capable of winning on the long courses. Yep. We Good want point. 58 people in the major championship who you could make a case to win that that week. Loads of other general business to get through. Bruce Devlin, the interview with him on our road to the Open, not too far away as well. But, uh, Blakey, uh, Hazy, you brought our, our attention to a fantastic story out of the Australian Golf Club during the week where a record was made by a 15-year-old, Thomas Heaton. He's been good enough to join us in the middle of the practice round, and you can explain the magnitude of the story. Uh, Thomas, congratulations on doing what you did. 15 years old, becoming the youngest winner of the club championship of all time at the Australian Golf Club. That's a hell of a feat. Thank you. Tom, I mean, it's one thing to say that, you know, down at uh, one of your local hacker courses, but this is the Australian Golf Club. This is one of the story clubs in Australian golfing history. And what's more, mate, I understand it was your first time round at the club championship, which is going to make people very, very ill hearing that. Yeah, it's my first time around there because I've only just joined the club probably a year ago. So it's my first club championship there. And early in the year, I won Wollongong Golf Club Club Championship, but it's nothing compared to the Australian. It's a one of the oldest clubs in the country, and it's a real honour to win it. So, Geez, you're doing the right things by all the management there saying that, mate. That's outstanding from you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so tell us about your progress through the club championship, Thomas. Was it a, um, a fairly straightforward stroll for you, or did you get pushed along the way? Um, a little bit. Um, well, the first match, well, I played qualifying, so 36 holes to make it into the match play, the club championship, and I come second there so I qualified second into the club championship and I played Andrew Blackman's first 36 holes I beat him 8 and 7 oh, and then I moved along to uh, I played James Brownlow next no actually Chris McCall I played next and I beat him 5 and 3 and then I versed James Brownlow in the next match and I beat him 3 and 2 and then I won in the final five and three. Holy cow. Eagle Eagle Birdie to beat him. <laughs> who, who was that against, mate, in the final? James Sampson. Do you, you'll have to go and introduce yourself to the 16th, 17th and 18th holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. How hard do you find that course, uh, Tom? Because I've always felt that the Australian was probably the hardest sort of championship course in Australia, having said that. Jordan Spieth went out around there in 63, and then Rod Pampling went a couple lower than that a couple of years yeah. later. So when, when you get going, obviously you can you can score, but how hard do you find it? Do you play, For instance, do you play the first as a par five? Yeah, we play the first yeah. as a par five. In the tournaments, it's yeah. par four, yeah. Yeah. 
Do you find it but hard I, or not? Clearly yeah, not. Yeah, I find the course pretty hard because it's pretty long track off the black. And yeah. the par threes there are just... Like, I hit five wood off nearly every par three. So it's one of the longest courses I play around. And just being a junior there, it's pretty tough, the course, because you hit a lot of driver four iron. You hit a lot of... And it's a championship greens where the greens are pretty hard and fast, so... Is it true that you've only been playing golf a few years? Yeah, five years, yeah. And I got a hole-in-one in my first competition round. So. Down, that was down, at, down in Wollongong? Yeah. Which, which club at Wollongong? Um, Russellvale. So it's like a little par 59 on the 10th hole. So I'm the first hole-in-one. We, Thomas, did, wow. we just had about 20,000 20, listeners just croak and groan oh, and turn off then. Tom. Thomas, there are, there are club, <laughs> there are blokes who have been, and women who have been club members for 25, 30 years, have played thousands of rounds of golf, have never got past the first round of club championships and never had a hole in one. They're listening to your story, and I think you're making, probably making them all feel a little bit ill right now. <laughs> So, so where do you want to take your golf, Tom? What, what have you got? I mean, are you just are you. I mean, fifteen years of age. It's hard to have anything sort of too sh- sort of strictly mapped out in front of you. But is this something that you have um, lofty ambitions? You know. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, it's hard to say at fifteen years old. But obviously, I want to try and progress through the amateur ranks and to the, try and play some high level men's tournaments and um, just further my golf up to becoming a professional. Hopefully, on the European tour, I'd love to get on to the European tours. My dad's family's from there and it'd just be great playing all those courses and then hopefully get transferred onto the PGA Tour and play there. So it'd be great uh, ambassador of mine to try and get onto that tour. So. That's music to a lot of people's yeah. ears, Tom. That, I mean, so many kids who have blinkers on for the US, so that's great to hear that you know, you, you're know you prepared to go and travel the world and hone your craft. Yeah. That's fantastic. And you're already at plus one, I believe, on the handicap scale? Yeah, yeah plus one, yeah. So how's that handicap been moving south in the last couple of years, your, your sort of progression to that low mark? what, How quickly have you seen it come down in the last couple of years? Um, pretty quickly. Over the last couple of years, it's sort of been around the scratch mark ever since I was about 14. So it's been around scratch. To plus, I got to plus two earlier in the year. I'm back to plus one, but I was off 20 when I first started when I was 10. So it's Gee. definitely come down a fair bit over the years. So it's, it's, playing different golf courses, it changes a lot, playing hard at golf courses like the Australian compared to Wollongong. Now, yeah. mate, golf has obviously got your attention now and you seem like you've got a pretty nice plan, but it wasn't always that way. We understand that you uh, might have turned down a trial with a very famous sporting club as well. Yeah. Well, I won an Illawarra Football Academy trial when I was about 12, and that was when I got the chance to go over and trial for Alexander Crew, Fulham, and Man United as well. And they offered me to go and trial there, but I turned it down because I wanted to try and pursue my golf and just further my golf, yeah. Jose Mourinho. Or who's your coach? Who, who, are, you, who are you getting lessons from at the moment? Um, Gary Barter. So Gary Barter v Jose Mourinho. I reckon you've made the right call. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't, doesn't throw the toys out of the cot, Gary. Nah, you want to steer clear of blokes like Mourinho. You're no good. <laughs> yeah, uh, so how many how many times a week? Just for like there might be other sort of thirteen, fourteen, fifteen year olds listening to this in the car with yeah. their old man. Or how many times a week are you at the golf club, getting lessons, practicing? Is it possible for you to sort of tell us how many times a week, and maybe even how many hours a week you're kind of working at the game? Um, I would say pretty around practicing, probably about nearly eighteen hours a week. It's pretty solid, isn't it? hours a week. Yeah. yeah. I try and get every hour, because I've got a net in my backyard and a putting green, so I try and even, if I can't get to the golf course, I can just work there, just hit on the net or have a putt on my putting green. Just doing something evolving around golf, even made training, like doing my stretching drills that Matt Green gives me or just stuff around that. So about 18 hours, I'd say. Well, I know, but there's, there's that famous photo of Arnold Palmer's hands, and he reckons if you're going to be a proper golfer, I don't know how, but there's like 13 different callus points you're supposed to have oh. on your hands. What are your, your, your young 15-year-old hands? How many um, <laughs> serious parts of your hands have you worn out already? Oh, a fair few. Everyone at school just always says, what's that? I said, <laughs> oh, it's from golf. I'm playing all the time. <laughs> That's great. Hard work. It's probably about six, seven. 
out there. Oh, mate. We're all envious in here, I can assure you of that. Yeah. Anyone, anyone here got a club championship alongside there, no? Yeah, not so no. no, we have not. Um, <laughs> Thomas, well played, mate. Uh, it's a, Thank you it's very a, much. It's a great story. Your name's um, etched onto the history boards of the Australian Golf Club, one of the really story clubs in Australia forever. And um, I think anybody listening to this will be keeping an eye on the name T. Heaton on the way through to see how you go, mate. All the very best. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Good no, you, thanks Tom. for joining Appreciate us on the show. Tom. Thank you. Thomas Heaton joining us. That's a great story, isn't it? I mean, gee whiz. I think some talent. Uh, Andy, I think I've shortchanged myself. I want a B-grade indoor biased bowls club championship pairs at, camp, at Camperdown. Up? I did up, fail to mention the net trophy at the Australian Golf Media Association <laughs> I don't think either of those two things are to be proud of, boys. Okay. Oh, okay. To be okay. honest, I, well, I don't want to rain on your parade. So I know it's all about self, the self congratulation. I'm actually defending quarter. that trophy next week. Are you really? Yes. I who's, am. You, who's your stiffest opposition in that? Well, one of them is uh, withdrawn, and that would be my friend Mark Hayes sitting here right with me. He's, he's out because he's got to go to Adelaide to do something re- relating to his day job as media manager Golf <laughs> Australia but uh, we're playing Royal Melbourne West next nice, Monday. Nice, mm. Hey, that is, we, we, you weren't flipping at all when if people could hear the applause in the background when he said oh. my first part of my real serious professional ambition is to go to Europe and spend time there. That is music to our ears. Can you imagine all the guys we've spoken to on the road to the Open hearing that and going, oh, thank God. Mm. We've finally got someone who's prepared to grind away uh, and I'm not potting the Ryan Ruffles types of the world, Brett Kletters, the who go away to the States with the stars in their eyes. But it was a breeding ground for Australian success for a very long time, the European tour, and it's been just knocked off the off the front pages by the dominance of the US tour. Uh, I was thrilled to hear that. I broke into unscripted Rap- applause. Almost rapturous applause. Oh, it's just great to hear a 15-year-old kid have a different take on it. That's I, I fantastic. Didn't, didn't ask him, Hazy, but is he, he's been under the notice of the New South Wales yeah. state programs. So very much. He's, yeah. he's represented... At junior and development level yeah. to the New South Wales um, teams already, and I think he's on the long distance on the GA radar. So you know he's a very promising kid, and you can hear his voice. He's he's pretty well grounded. So yeah, absolutely, that's mm. fant- I, I That's great. It was really good news to hear him say that. Whether he gets there is immaterial. Oh, mate, it's a lot of work to be done between now and then for sure. Correct. Absolutely, but yeah, to think that you know you're prepared to go and. You know, suffer through the grind of Adam Scott style living in Croissancier or whatever it's oh, called. Grind, in. grind away, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. He might have a villa there in twenty years' time. Is that, is that Hopefully, a segue to the uh, European? Well, tour? of course it is. Of yeah. course it is. <laughs> he's had a big fortnight, Justin Rose. Justin Rose is so good, isn't he? He's he's so smooth. The closer, like two in a row. It's yeah. amazing, and he's sort of been helped a little bit uh, by you know front runners who have fallen over in both tournaments, but. He has to be good enough to make it happen and put himself in a position to win. And he's done that with spectacular back nines on the Sunday um, in Turkey mm. and in China. Mm. Uh, it's been a phenomenal fortnight for him. It is. And uh, the European Tour goes to Sun City, South Africa this week as well, Andy, for the Ned Bank. It's interesting. That, that tournament is worth $7.5 million. It's kind of an exhibition tournament, isn't mm. it? It's not a full... <laughs> Full field, but um, there's a there's a, a a part of me looks at that and goes, that's part of the European tour. Is that where we could, you know, wouldn't we like to get the Australian Open to to that kind of level? They've hooked in with the European tour. They obviously pay a lot of appearance money. I'd imagine uh, seven point five million dollars is a lot of money. The other interesting thing is that the uh, road to Dubai is next week, or the Dubai World Championship is next week, the Tour Championship for Europe, and. Uh, this is the second last event. Only one of the top five is actually playing this week. They're all trying to get their break. So That's... Fleetwood, who's who's on top of Tommy Fleetwood, is playing, but he's the only one of the top five. The others, such as Rose, Sergio, John Rahm, not playing. So, that, is, that is interesting. So we it? always say, you know, I've said to you myself before, I think with the Australian Open, we need to get the prize money up, but it doesn't guarantee you that you get the best players if it doesn't fit in the schedule, does it? And it for, does, for instance, Spieth but, and these people are Johnson. They're all they're all resting. At and that's and, and therein lies a part of the problem. When you, we we occasionally roll our eyes when we hear these players say, oh, "Look, I'm tired and I need a break." And well, if they're not turning up to that event in, the, in the desert, and they're not turning mm. up to Ned Bank, a couple of withdrawn from there, then mm. it does stand the argument. The argument does stack up if they say, "Look, oh, I'd love to come down to Australia and play, but." I'm knackered and I want to spend some time with my family. And, mm. you know, 
there is an element, as much as we don't want to mm. have that as a reason, I think you have to accept the fact that it's a long year. These blokes chase the bucks, you know, on bigger stages around the world, and fatigue does become a factor at the end of the season. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, you, you, you can't stare at a woman or a man in the face and say you're an idiot when they say my family is more important to me. Yeah, That's, spot on. So uh, one interesting thing with that, Blakey, is there was, a, there was a song and dance made at Augusta, I don't know, five or six years ago now when South Africa was awarded a WGC event. It was going to be called the Sun something or other. I can't remember. Uh, it was big hoo-ha. And it never got off the ground, not once. Um, you know, it was meant to be the first inaugural tournament. It was going to be seven or eight months after that in the South African summer. And, you know, big hoo-ha about it. And it obviously never materialized. Um, there were trade-offs around the South African Open date and everything to happen. And it's really interesting that they've got great events like the Joburg Open, the South African Open, the Shwani Open, all those things who now play second fiddle financially at least and in the terms of ability to attract a world-class field, even if it's a short um, field event, to a tournament that was never really there and it was a bit of a made-for-TV thing and a Gary Player special. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know, is there something in that for Australian golf? Do we have to look outside the Australian Open or the Australian PGA Championship? Well, one would hope not, but we need to keep our options open about what that event might be that eventually lures the world-class fields here. Gee, if only there was a Kerry Packer around now yeah. who was prepared to invest right. in the game like this yeah. uh, and just say, right, oh, boys, what's it going to take? Oh, here, it's on the table. Here it is. Come well, this is, it. This is what's happening in Korea with that event that was a couple of weeks ago in South Korea where yeah. there's a company there, and it's not jumping into my head, the name CJ. of CJ. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the big toy. Yeah, yeah, CJ yeah. Open It's a very big yeah. company, and they've just they started off just – with a tournament, and then they, they convinced the USPGA Tour that could become part of that, and it's going to be an ongoing thing. They now have a you know six $7 million great tournament. Great field. Great yeah. field turned up. Yeah. Fantastic finish. So Patrick Cantlay, Andy, mm. uh, on the PGA Tour, won last week in Vegas. Um, you know, another good young American player, 25 years of age, just with the Spieths and Johnsons and Thomases of the world. It's, it's another one. Another one. Mm. You need to play a bit quicker. He's a bit slow. But um, from an Australian perspective, doesn't Aaron Baddeley just keep on keeping on? He just, Tried 10th. And yeah. he's going to kick himself. He had the double on 18 uh, in his 74 on Saturday. Only finishes three back. Um, he's it, We sort of... I know he had a win last season. He sort of won late in the oh, season last year. Like two years, I think. Yeah, like seasons and oh, years six. get a bit... Gotcha. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like I back do. in 2016. Yep. So he's still really relevant, but for a lot of us, Bad's is a bit of an afterthought in terms of what we're providing on the PGA Tour and the big scheme and the big picture of world golf at the moment. But Baddeley is finding a way, as he has always done, to stay competitive, keep the money to where it needs to be to keep his card. And Bob's up probably more often than we give him credit for um, in terms of competing is he's a legitimate contender in that second tier event uh, hopefully he can take the step up and compete in the yeah. big ones um i reckon we'll try and get him on early next year andy at some point because he's you know he, he still loves australia and he doesn't get down here as much as he wants to and he's precluded from coming this year as he chases the the you know the power in his card and get a re-rank up the up the scale but um i reckon he'll kick himself when he hangs up the sticks in a few years time for all that tinkering around with his swing Spot and the on. stack and tilt garbage that he went with for a while and how to remedy it and da 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 da, da comes back to his old coaches and goes bang. Yep. And, I, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. We've already talked about Tiger and he's up to about his 203rd swing rebuild, Blakey. So oh, he's, he, he, look, he's had a solid career, Aaron. Uh, the problem is that he built up such incredible expectations early yeah. on by winning those two Australian Opens and we thought he was going to be a, you know, a world beater. Mm. And he's not. He's proven not to be. He's a great putter. He hits the ball all over the place mm. most of the time. Uh, I do think he's he's underachieved a little bit, but having said that, he's had a decent career. He has. Uh, he's That's... a great guy. Uh, he always aimed high. He always said, I aim high and the misses are better. You know, When he changed all those coaches and changed his swing and did all that stuff, he was always trying because he thought he could get better. You know, And, and it, it messed up for him, mm. unfortunately. That was the end of um, Blakey's outstanding footy career. Murray, when he got the hat on, put on after the game, it said gazelle.com. 
That was the end of his. I've got a beds.com cap at home somewhere. Have you really? An orange beds.com cap somewhere. Oh, that's that'll be worth a bit of cash. I've got it somewhere. I'll bring yeah. it in next. I'll wear it next week right. on the show. So they're in Mexico this week, PGA <laughs> Tour. <laughs> Playa del Carmen. Have you ever been there? I've seen it on TV. Bomber you Thompson. Been, have you? I have, yeah. Bomber Thompson, who for those outside of Victoria who don't follow uh, AFL footy, was the former coach of Geelong and Essendon. Uh, he told me that's the best place in the world to go for a holiday. <laughs> Playa del Carmen. Oh, that's any, where the golf is this week. Anyone who says that a resort is the greatest place mm. to go for a holiday needs to spread their wings a bit further. Right? Yeah, probably. probably. We, what about the women's uh, Park Sung Hyun, world number one at 24 years of age, Hazy? Yeah, it's it's a great achievement for an outstanding year without a lot of wins. In, interestingly enough, but uh, um, I'm I'm disappointed on a personal note to see so on you not there because yeah you know she's a friend of this program and we've had her on and uh, but it's a you know it's been such an amazing year when Shan Shan Fung won the other day. Mm. Did you realise she was the first multiple winner on the LPGA Tour this year? Wow, is that right? Okay. Yeah, it's taken till the start of November to get wow. a to get a dual winner. So, so, so they've had four number ones this year. Lydia Ko mm. started the year at number one. Aria Jatanagan took over from her. So Yon Yu took over from her, and now uh, Park Sung Hyun. Yeah. So, isn't that great for women's golf? I it's mean, a spread. it is super for women's golf. It's awesome, absolutely awesome. Uh, Minji Loon, Sarah Jane Smith, mm. probably worth noting their performance in that tournament in Japan. The LPGA Tour went to Japan. Both flew home on the weekend. Yeah. Had really strong weekend finishes to uh, finish deep inside the top 10. So they both had terrific, terrific weeks. Yeah, they're both, uh, both of those plus Catherine Kirk and Sue are all going to be in the Tour Championship, yeah. which is next week in Great Florida. Effect. They've got one tournament in China this week, which by the time people listen to this will possibly be over. But, uh, you know, Minji, I heard an interview with Minji Lee after her first round yesterday in China, and uh, she said she was tired. She's played five weeks in a row, and I think 20, maybe 26 tournaments for the year. Yeah. It's, it's it's a grind for them, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of travel involved, and she's not a you know she's a young woman. I mean, it, it's going to be pretty tough for her. But uh, no wins this year, Hazy. She'd be disappointed with that, Minji, for the the level of player that she is. She's been consistent, and she's won a she's million won dollars, a million. but yeah. uh, hasn't quite saluted. Um, it's a tough stretch of the year for Min- Minji. Is actually a really good example of a tough stretch in the year for a lot of the players who, if as you check out their uh, apparel, have all got Hana Bank or. KB Bank or whatever it is, all Asian sponsorship, all have expectations on them to come and play this swing. And there's, you know, you can't rest this week because it's going to cost us X on our sponsorship yeah, with yep. you. So they are all compelled to play. Um, there's quite a lot of Americans who don't have that same compulsion and who don't show up every week. But uh, it's an interest. It's an interesting. Um, it's not an anomaly. It's a phenomenon because of the the financial powerhouse that is women's golf in Asia. That that's what happens. Okay, let's get, uh, there's a whole lot of other bits and pieces with some real focus on some uh, domestic stuff uh, before we wrap it up. We'll do that after we continue our road to the Open Series and one of the giants of Australian golf about to join us. G'day, I'm my golf ambassador Jason Day. I'm really excited to be an ambassador for my golf, Australian Golf's National Junior Program, jointly run by Golf Australia and the PGA. My golf is every Aussie kid's first step on their golfing pathway. It's all about teaching children the basic skills of golf in a safe and healthy environment. And just as importantly, about the life skills that golf can teach you that distinguish our sport from the rest. Remember to visit mygolf.org.au for more information. G'day, I'm Greg Chalmers. I'm a long way from home here in Dallas, Texas, but I love catching up with all the Aussie golf news on Inside the Rugs. Welcome back to Inside the Ropes and joining us today on our Inside the Ropes segment, one of our most special guests that we've had in this time, the 1960 Australian Open champion, Bruce Devlin. Bruce, uh, welcome all the way from Texas. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, nice to be here. 80, 80 years old and one day old. <laughs> 80 years young, though, I believe. You're still, still travelling beautifully. Uh, well, I'm still doing okay, I guess, considering... Mate, how does 19, when we say the 1960 Australian Open champion, when, how does that sound to you? Does it sound ancient history or does it sound like yesterday? No, it's probably, well, it's, it has a, a dual significance, I guess. You know, I, I was, uh, certainly wasn't expected to win the Open back then as an amateur and I had played not so good in the games uh, prior to the Open. I forget how many times I lost for New South Wales, probably a couple of times at least. And then to win the Open and uh, beat, a, beat a dear old friend of mine, Teddy Ball, that was, a, that was pretty exciting. And to leave 
Peter Thompson and Kel Nagel uh, behind was pretty special, really. So when you say in New South Wales there, am I right in saying it was the Interstate Series that you played a couple of weeks previous? Correct, it was. Yeah, it sure was. It's a, it's a massive step up when we think about it these days to the Australian Open from the Interstate Series, but at the time there were quite a few amateurs in the field, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon. Uh, yeah. Did it seem like a big step to you? Uh, oh, I don't know. I guess, I guess it was in one way. Although I'd had a, uh, I'd had an extended relationship with Kel Nagel for a very, very long time uh, since I was, I played in a golf tournament with him when I was seventeen years old. So, uh, you know, I've felt comfortable in the fact that uh, that just he alone was there was uh, was enough to me to sort of calm me down. I mean, I never, I never thought really that much about winning it until. Sort of the end. Bruce, you were an amateur at the time, as as you mentioned, uh, but you were about 22, 23 years of age, I understand. So nowadays to us that seems late to be... You, I think you might have turned pro the next year, is that right? Yeah, I didn't turn pro until uh, April of 62. Well, the first tournament I played in for cash... Uh, Mike Clayton... No, none of you guys didn't know because you're all too damn young. But... Um, <laughs> When I turned pro in Australia, I couldn't accept any prize money. No, well, Bruce, we spoke with Roger Davis about this because yeah. in 1974, Roger finished sixth in the, fifth in the Australian Open at Karen, at Karen Up, ironically, and uh-huh. got no money. So, so there was, what, six months? With, no, 12 months. 12 months where you couldn't get any money? It was outrageous when you think about it. Correct. You had to, you had to prove that you could make a living, which was, a, you know, really a crock, wasn't it? Yeah, when well, it was just a it. club pros to but, pay in their patch, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Not only that, but I, I'm, you know, I'm my my memory's a little bit foggy about. But I believe that I won a couple of golf tournaments that year too. Uh, as as a what would you call it, an apprentice pro, probationary pro, I think they call yeah. it whatever. Yeah. And I had to I had to actually write a letter to the PGA of Australia to get permission to play in the 1962 Masters. Because it was three weeks earlier than my one-year probation. <laughs> the, the U.S. Masters. Yeah, the Masters in <laughs> Augusta, Georgia. <laughs> it's just so far-fetched for anyone coming through now to hear that. Well, yeah, well, it's, yeah. it's pretty ridiculous, really, when you think about it. Yeah. But that, that's, that's exactly how it happened. Tell us about the 60 Open. You shot uh, 69, 69, 69, so you were clearly in front, I think, after three days. And then 75 in the last round, you got there by... <laughs> A well, shot. A Do you remember much about it? <laughs> a bit shaky the the last round. Uh, you know, when, when you start to realise that you got an opportunity to win the Open, it's a pretty special sort of thing. And then uh, I I can remember my uh, my last three shots clearly. Uh, I drove it okay on the last hole, then I pulled my second shot down underneath the green, and then got it up and down from about eight feet to win. So it was. Uh, was pretty nervous. <laughs> was Teddy Ball in your group, or had he already posted his score? No, or? no, he'd already posted his. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah, needed that yeah, eight footer to win. Yeah. So, so Ted had won the amateur of the week. I think you was. It, well, am I right to say that they played the interstate series, then the amateur, and then the open three weeks in a row? That's. Is it... Um, you know, I, I can't. To be honest with you, I can't remember. All I remember is I was on the on the New South Wales team and 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 didn't perform. Uh, at my best during that series. So, so Bruce, you, 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 I think you were born in Armadale, off, up north anyhow in New South Wales. When, yes, did, when, I was. Did, when did you come down to Sydney and what club did you go to? Well, uh, my dad was in the plumbing business and we moved to, uh, when we left Armadale, when I, I think I was about only about six months old and we moved to Goulburn and he was in the plumbing business. And then when I, when I started to play, uh, you know, started to look like I could play a little bit, uh, I became a member at the Lakes. Uh, so I would drive down from, uh, I'd drive, drive down from Goulburn to Sydney to play in the, uh, and I forget the name of the matches, but, you know, the inter-club matches of a Saturday. Eric Appley, maybe? Was that what they were called then? Uh, I can't remember what okay. they were called. Okay. But, uh, and then, uh, then when I, uh, just after I got married, my wife and I, Gloria, we moved to Melbourne and I became a member at Commonwealth. And I used to play in the 
Saturday matches at Commonwealth, for Commonwealth, uh, and then, then we'd go to the Aussie Rules game, wherever it was. Try to beat your opponent real quick so you got to see the <laughs> entire football game. Who was your teammate in Melbourne? <laughs> oh, uh, Eric Routley was one. Uh, don't ask me the other guys. I can't remember. <laughs> It was that great. Was only, uh, how long ago was that, boys? That was only like 50, 60, yeah. almost. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's a long time ago. <laughs> was there a guy called Graham Wilson playing then? Uh, that name rings a bell, yes. He was a friend of my dad's. He's a member of I, I played with him when I was a kid. He was a really good player. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I think he was on the team. Yeah. But I wouldn't, I, you know, I wouldn't guarantee that, that was right. So we, moving from 1960, there was a... Uh, and the, there was a more painful experience for you at the Lakes a few years later. Do you remember? Much I of... remember very, very well, and I, I, I... I'm sure you do. Yeah. But, oh yeah. yeah talk had, talk, talk uh, about that one as well. Yeah, I was uh, I was responsible for bringing the guy that whooped my ass on the playoff uh, over to the country. To be honest, well, he was a crap player though, wasn't he? Not, he wasn't very good. <laughs> no, he was he was a bit of a hacker, but that day he played beautifully. I know in the in the play, I had him. I had to make five at the lakes to win. And I hit my second shot underneath the green about, I don't know, 40 or 50 yards and hit a pitch shot up there and then sucked it off the green and then hit it 12 feet past the hole and missed it. And then, of course, Nicholas just... I think I shot 69 the next day, but it wasn't even a contest. And, and when of course you say it, you were responsible for bringing him out, talk us through that. Yeah, well, you know, I had I had a relationship with the... Uh, with the uh, WD and HO Wills people back in those days, and uh, we, we had we had the ability to, to bring some of the players out, and uh, Jack and Barbara came out, and uh, part of the deal was with McCormick in those days too. We were both with McCormick, and uh, Mark he, McCormick, yeah. he came out. We played some exhibitions. We played an exhibition in uh, Adelaide and one in Melbourne uh, prior to the Open. So you're referring to the 1964 Australian Open year and Jack Nicholas, obviously. That back in the days of the uh, the additional playoff, uh, what are you what are your thoughts on the way things have gone there? And, and you know, the playoff itself was it something you ever felt you were in in contention with, or is it did it get out of your hands pretty quickly? Uh, no, I mean it, it wasn't completely out of you know out early, but uh, he just you know he just kept making birdies. <laughs> 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 I just couldn't match him, you know, and he was. Uh, I think one day during the tournament, if I'm correct, uh, if we'll remember, the 16th hole was a uh, across the lake. He used to drive, hit it to the left side and then pitch it over the water to the green before the par three seventeen. Yeah, well, It'll Nick be 14 was, now, I think. Well, well, no, well, the, yeah. I, I think the last hole, Bruce, was the 14th in reverse, the current 14th in reverse. But the hole you're talking about, for those who can't see it, you, I think you, you play from the 11th green at the lakes now. And you hit, you would hit across to the short and then pitch across the water. And That's Nick, it. Yeah, and, and Nicholas yeah. drove it all the way across the water under the under the green, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah the only person I, that I'd ever seen been you know capable of doing that sort of thing. Mm. And, am I right in saying I'm, I've got no recollection of this in front of me at all? But am I right in saying that was a a, a ball ran back to your feet um, during the final hole of regulation when you had a chance to get it, up and down and win? It came back pretty close to me. So what what shot was that? You had to, you had to make a par to, to. Yeah, I had to make a par, and I had a you know I had a little pitch with a sand wedge, and I put too much spin on it, and I pulled it back against you know pulled it back, and it dribbled off the front, and that green is uh, you know it was up pretty high. Uh, it was always very difficult to put it on the green in two, so a lot of times you'd lay it up short and then pitch it up, and unfortunately caught it too good and spun it right off the green. So as a young bloke, then did that did that rock you that you lost that? It was a chance to yeah, beat Jack that Nicholas. A, that was pretty. That was pretty tough, to be quite honest with you. To you know, to have it right there and to be you know have the ability to be beating him at the same time was, uh, uh, well, you know, it's, it's like all the guys. You know, we're, we're we're friends off the golf course, but we want to beat one another's brains in. So, um, am I right to say the first time you? Came across Nicholas, was it Marion in 1960 at the Eisenhower Cup when Nicholas Actually, did that? Actually, a little earlier than okay. that. I, I, uh, I, was, I was picked on the Eisenhower Cup team for the second year in a row in 60, and I decided to come over early, uh, and I went to Columbus, Ohio, and I spent uh, four days with Nicholas at his house 
watched him watched him and Jack Grout work on their game, and then we he and I drove to St. Louis to play in the U.S. Amateur. Okay. And I don't know whether I should say this, but a little turd beat us both. Dean Beeman. Dean Beeman. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we were consoling one another driving back to Columbus before we went into Philadelphia for the uh, Eisenhower Cup matches that, that Beeman could beat both of us. You know, this we're is the guy that went on to run the tour? Woods. This is the guy that went on to run the, the, the tour. tour. Yeah. yeah, correct. <laughs> so He became the commissioner. So what were... Um, I mean, Nicholas's scores that week were... I mean, that was kind of rock the world, didn't it, at, at that time? Yeah, he broke... Uh, oh, I don't, look, I think I tied... I think I tied Hogan's scoring record there, and Beeman beat me, and Nicholas beat him by, like, five shots, I think. So, yeah. I mean, it was a ridiculous number that Jack shot. Yeah. Talks through the greatness of, of Nicholas, what, what made him what he was uh well obviously he had talent but he had one thing that was uh, probably better than most other people and that was a mind uh he had a he had the great ability to be doing other things before he had to hit a shot and then when he hit the shot when he was ready to hit the shot he went into some sort of a cocoon uh he was he was remarkable that way you walk down the fairway with him playing golf with him and tell the joke and the next minute uh, you know, he sort of sh- switch went off. You still friends with him? Yeah, lo- yeah. Mm. Well, I've I've always been friends with him. He's been one of the great people that I've ever met in the game. And Bruce, you finished. Uh, we looked this up before. You top ten in all four of the majors over your career, but interestingly, twice you were fourth at the Masters at Augusta. Yeah. How did you find that? Because I think Clayt said off air. That you had one instance, I think in '68. Did you say, Clates, that you were first man to break? Should have possibly se- should have won. For first person to break, se- spoke 73 times in the Masters and not win. I think was that right, Bruce? Yeah. Well, I, I, was, I actually, I had a three-shot lead on Saturday, going to the 11th hole, and I drove the ball left, and it was a short pin, right across the big mound in front yeah. of the green, and I thought I'd hit a pretty good shot about three or four yards right of the flag, but I didn't carry it far enough, and it pitched on the down slope and kicked left and went in the water. Mm. And then I dropped it in the drop zone and didn't hit it far enough, and it hit the bank and went back down in the water. And then I followed it in the water and took a couple of whacks at it and uh, finally made an eight, Ooh. which wasn't very good. <laughs> Did you like that course, Augusta National? Yeah, I always love playing there. I think for, uh, uh, you know, I, I keep hearing this sometimes on the TV where people say for a, for a period of uh, 10 years, and don't ask me what those years were, but for a period of 10 years, I think I had the lowest scoring average at Augusta and, and never won the tournament. I'm going to run through that for, for people who are listening here. This is Bruce Devlin at the Masters from 1964. His final results, 4th, 15th, 28th, 10th, 4th, 19th, 31st, 13th, 5th and 8th. I mean, it's an extraordinary record, Bruce. You must be... I mean, obviously, you'd love a green jacket in your wardrobe, but that's uh, that's something to be very proud of, I'd imagine. Yeah, I, you know, I always loved to play there, and um, uh, it was a, it was always fun to be in contention. Uh, I started... Uh, the, the last year that... Uh, the last year that... I think it was Palmer won in 64, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had... He had, a, I think, a three-shot lead on me going to the last day, and I started uh, birdie, 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 and I was playing with Gary Player, and uh, we get to the get to the fourth hole, and uh, I hit a frozen rope at the flag, and it looked like you know I was going to make four four birdies in a row, and it sort of pitched on the edge of the green, and then it sort of dribbled back down in the bunker, but only you know six or eight feet, ten feet from the hole, probably at the most. And player hit it in the back left. And uh, I, I've often talked to him about this over the years. He hit a 40-footer and he knocked it uh, nine feet past the hole and said he was going to finish. And then he hit it four feet past the hole and said he was going to finish. And then he missed it again and oh. made a quick five and I was still standing in the bunker lying one. And I was a little upset 
to say the least. <laughs> it's good to see you've let it go after all these years. Yeah, isn't it good to see that it didn't bother me? <laughs> <laughs> you would have been cold by the time you got around to your second. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I hit, a be- I hit a beautiful bunker shot out of there and sort of lipped it around about three and a half feet and missed it. And, uh, you know, then it was uh, tough for the rest of the day. So did you talk about it with Gary at the time, or did it just come up later in no, conversation? No, I didn't talk. I, I never talked to him about it at the time. I was, you know, I was still trying to, you know, win. But I, I said to him a couple of times, you know, why, why did you do that? And he said, you know, be honest with you, Bruce, I wasn't even thinking about what I was doing. Uh, the the fir- first part I hit it was terrible, and I sort of walked around, hit it, and hit the next one and missed it. And all of a sudden, you're standing in the bunker. So, um, Bruce, you were, I guess you played a lot with Hogan. For some, I mean, obviously you had a great relationship with him, it seems. Reading I did. Book. I had a wonderful relationship with him, and it was all because of Norman von Neider. Okay, because the, yeah, the Von was friends with him, wasn't he? I, I remember talking to the Von about him. He, Hogan used to call Von the little man. The was, little man, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the little man and the wee Iceman were yeah. big buddies. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I got to Augusta in 1962, and um, Norman was there and asked Hogan if he would play a practice round with me. And uh, he said, certainly. And from 1962 at Augusta through until Ben retired, what, 69, I think he retired? Uh, 67, was I that must, the last oh, one he played? No, we yeah. must have played 25, 30 practice okay. rounds together. Awesome. Uh, and the best week I think I ever had in my life was with him. Uh, in those days, my wife was with me, and we came from Florida somewhere to Dallas. And when we got to Dallas, uh, Ben and Valerie Hogan got on the plane, and we went to San Francisco for the Open at Olympic. And we stayed at the top of the Mark Hotel, and we went to the golf course every day. We had dinner every night. It was quite a, uh, quite a remarkable week. So his reputation was that he wouldn't let people in, but clearly, if you were in his circle, oh yeah, was he was a, he was a terrific guy. Don't, don't, you know, I mean, I know people, I know people rag on the fact that he was cold and heartless and all the rest of that, but that was he probably wouldn't token. suffer fools, huh? He wouldn't suffer fools, would he? No, and I'll give you a perfect example of that. In 1980, the first uh, televising of the Legends of Golf at Onion Creek in uh, Texas in Austin. Uh, that was the very first year, and John Brody, the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers and myself, were doing the, we were in the booth. He was doing play-by-play, and I was doing color. And uh, prior to the tournament, Don Allmeyer, uh, who just passed away uh, a week and a half ago, uh, and he said to me, "Look, I know you've had I know you've had a wonderful relationship with Hogan for all these years. Would, you know, would you ask him to uh, come up and spend an hour in the tower with you on Sunday?" And I said, "Well, I would ask him, but I can already give you the answer." <laughs> and he said, "Well, what would that be?" Uh, I, he said, "I'll I'll nearly I'll nearly give it to you verbatim. It's." Uh, Bruce, that would be great. I'd love to do that, and I'm glad you're doing the tournament and all the rest of it, but I couldn't put up with the same questions I've been dealing with for the last 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> is, that a, is that a bit of a pity, do you think, in some ways, that the, the rest of the world didn't get to know him the way you did? I think it is a pity. Yeah, if you, uh, if you think about him, he was a great patriot for this country. You know, he gave, gave up his career and went to, you know, went into the Army, uh, He's, uh, he's, you know, he served his country. Uh, that was, I think, while he was in the army, it was when Byron Nelson won the eleven tournaments in a row. But uh, you know, he helped a lot. He's, he's helped a lot of young people, um, and of course, he was in the club manufacturing business, and he was just a great guy. Bruce, that, that you talk about the Open at Olympic. Was that a true story that? You were playing a practice round with him, and there's one fairway bunker at Olympic, and you asked him if the fairway bunker was in play, and he said, "No, you go right of it." Oh, <laughs> he's, he said a thing or two like that to me on, uh, on quite a few occasions. When you ask, you know, when you ask the dumb question, you yeah. get the you get the fancy answer. Yeah. And did you see anyone hit the ball better than Hogan? 
No, I haven't. And, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about practice rounds that we played together. The, the, I think one of the greatest uh, practice rounds that we ever played in was, at, was at Augusta. And uh, Hogan and I were playing Arnold uh, on the Tuesday. And I got off to a... We were playing. We were playing automatic two downs, and I got off to a pretty good start. I shot 31 on the front, and he cut me two. And then he drives it at 10, and doesn't quite get it off the slope. He's, so he's got a ball above the feet, uh, 190 yards, and he takes a forward out of his bag, and he's got about three inches hanging out the back of his left hand. And he hit a frozen rope to a foot. I can always see that shot that he hit. And, and I, um, you know, I, I didn't even have the guts to ask him how the hell you do something like that. Bruce, can you, can you, if you can take a step back from your life, I know it's impossible, but if you can, you're talking about, you know, the greats of world golf who are your friends and colleagues and, and, and playing partners. Is, is it sort of hard to reconcile that sometimes for a, a boy who grew up in Goulburn? Oh, most certainly is. Most certainly is. It's quite, it's it's quite remarkable, really, when you think about it. Uh, and and to be honest with you, uh, the first the first year that I went to Augusta, I had obviously uh, read lots about Arnold Palmer and Nicholas and Middlecoff and you know all players. Uh, and I I spent my first uh, first Masters just. You know, wandering around, looking at everybody, and trying to shake hands. You know, trying to say hello to them. It was like I was looking for an autograph. You know, and obviously my uh, golf uh, wasn't very good that year. <laughs> <laughs> so, after your you golf, you obviously have branched out into to different areas, still to do with golf, and I know you're still involved with it. Um, what's your passion? You were a commentator for a long time. Um, we can still hear your beautiful dulcet tones, but you've also in heavily involved in course design and, and presumably still are? Yeah, well, I, I don't do much anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm anxiously uh, watching what's happening to a golf club uh, <laughs> that I'm a member of here, an honorary member, I might say, at uh, Shady Oaks. Uh, quite a remarkable honour right there. I'm the, I'm the third person in 85 years that's been given an honorary membership to Shady Oaks. And uh, Mike and his boys uh, have done a beautiful job rebuilding the par three there. And I can't wait to see what they're going to do on the big course. Yeah, it should be fun. It's a great club, really. I mean, you go there and, I mean, Mike Wright's like the perfect club pro, really. It was kind Isn't of, he? He's just amazing. Yeah, and, 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 and you know how he got his job? Well, through Hogan, obviously. Yeah, well, 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 you can absolutely. tell the story. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the the other pro uh, moved on. I think he might have passed away, actually. And they were interviewing, oh, I don't know, you know, four or five different people. And Mr. Hogan went to the board and said, "Look, I want you to consider uh, Mike Wright." And uh, Mike Wright agreed. And Hogan told the board that if they if they put him on the staff for twelve months. And he wasn't happy, and they weren't happy with him that Mike Wright agreed to resign, which I thought was pretty interesting. For a 24-year-old, yeah, or whatever yeah. he was. He was young, yeah. So he's been there, what, 33 years, uh, I think. Whatever. Would that be right, Mike? I would, I would maybe longer, but, I mean, just the nicest bloke. And, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's partly in Australia we've lost that kind of I mean, the great club pro, the guy who kind yeah. of runs the club, really. I mean, he's, I mean, he's a remarkable bloke. But I mean, to go there and, I mean, when, when Hogan died, he left all his clubs to Mike. So, I mean, there were 900 yeah. clubs lying wow. around Shady Oaks in rooms and wow. you can go and p- hit his driver and it's, a, yeah. it's an amazing He's one piece iron of, there? Well, yeah, I'm not sure, no, the, I, think, I think the USJ have the one iron for Merriam, but yeah, no, it's, it's an amazing piece of history to go and look at Hold Hogan's well, clubs. And there's, and, a, there's a postscript to that too, Mike. Uh, there's a, uh, a museum in uh, uh, Dublin, Texas, mm. called the Hogan Museum. And he was born there, uh, and he, he owned a uh, facility there that uh, 
the great niece that now runs the Ben Hogan, or was the patriarch of the Ben Hogan Foundation, they went down there with a key and opened it up, and there was another six or eight hundred golf clubs there. Mm, wow. wow. And, uh, and I, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of it or not, but I've become very close with the Hogan Foundation. Uh, we do a, uh, we do a golf course, uh, we do a, a tournament at the, uh, at Fort Hood, which is the army base here in Texas, uh, because of Hogan. And, uh, this coming year will be the eighth year that we've done the golf tournament down there. And then last, not this previous May, but the May before, we had the night with the Aussies at, at, uh, uh, Shady Oaks with Shady Oaks, yeah, Adam and uh, Jeff, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah that we had, we had we had five of us up there. It was a fun night, and uh, that was that was put on by by the Hogan Foundation and my foundation. So just just filling in that gap, Bruce, if you don't mind, who's the third? I assume Mr. Hogan's the one, the second honorary member. Who's the third honorary member at Shady Oaks? No, Mr. Hogan is not oh. an honorary member. Mr. Hogan was a member. Period. He was a paying member. Okay. The other two are uh, Dan Jenkins. Is Dan Jenkins on? Dan Jenkins <coughs> and Nolan yeah. Ryan. Nolan Ryan. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Nolan Ryan and Dan Jenkins and myself. Has he given you some tips on how to throw a split finger fastball or something? <laughs> no, but I tell you what, he was pretty damn good. Yeah, he sure was. So yeah. you, you designed 150 plus courses or had a hand in them. Uh-huh. Which are the ones that stick in your mind? Oh. Uh, well, you know, I love the course that I built in Scotland at St Andrews, uh, at, at St Andrews Bay. Uh, there's two, you know, there's a good and a bad side to doing that. You know, you can do the best job you possibly can with the piece of land you got, but the old course sits across the water from you. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to beat that one. So you can't, you know, uh, historically I don't think it'll ever, you know, get the reputation that it, <laughs> may desire, may want, but I, I love the course I built down in uh, Buford, South Carolina, and that's the host of my tournament that I hold each year for the uh, team tournament for the best play, best amateur players in the country. Uh, it's called Secession. Yep. Bruce, um, you've, you've uh, among a handful of Australians who went across at the time, you could be regarded as a bit of a trailblazer, I reckon. Is that something that you sit sits proudly with you that you you know you managed to sort of open the gate for so many Australians to come across? Yeah, I think so. I you know I've always had a uh, I think a pretty good relationship with with all the guys that come across. Um, I pro- I suppose the one that I spent the most time with and became the closest with over the years was uh, was David that I gather you had on here. And, Two or three weeks David Graham, ago, yeah. Um, yeah. you won a World I, Cup with David, yeah. I did, yeah, mm. 1970 down in Argentina. Mm. Talk about I, I, I just started playing golf then. I remember reading stories about David was going to win the individual, and the Argentinians got a, a lobbing Roberto's ball back onto the green. But I mean, <laughs> um, there Roberto, was some skull nudgery yeah. going on. But, I can assure you. I, I mean, he was, which was not surprising in Argentina, but I mean. Talk about Roberto. I mean, I saw him play it in York in 1980, and when he was he was 57. I thought he was old at the time, but he's, he was younger than I am now. But I mean, yeah. I mean, he was a remarkable player, wasn't he, Roberto? Yes, he was. He was. Oh well, he had the he had a graceful, powerful swing. Uh, and you know, the guy that could hit it as far as him uh, back in the early days was the one Kelvin David George Nagel. Well, yeah, he was a he was a smasher. I remember used to see it in the newspaper where the sporting page would show where DiVincenzo and Nagel hit their drives when they're playing the lakes, you know, and they were comparing who was hitting the longest. But Cal kind of chopped his swing off and started the ball straight. And yeah, he uh, I think he I think he made the big change like in. Would have been nineteen sixty. Would that be right? Yeah. Well, he was forty when he won that Open there, but. I mean, yeah, I think, that, that I think was almost that was almost the start. Chance. It was almost the start of his international career. It was amazing how he. It was. Yeah, you know, I think it was the third major he'd ever played that Open. Yeah, uh, that's uh, probably right. And then all through the, I mean, he had an amazing record in the Open in the sixties, and he was always in the top ten. And yeah, what a did. what a player he was! Wow. 
Yeah, uh, more than that, what a guy! He was. Yeah, what a lovely. He was a lovely bloke. Yeah. yeah, and that Open Championship at St Andrews was only a couple of months before uh, the Open, the Australian Open that mm. we've been talking about today. So it was a pretty hot field. Yeah, mm. yeah, true, true. Bruce, we're gonna uh, we're gonna attempt some sort of broadcasting history here. I'm gonna actually th- risk all our licenses and everything here by throwing the uh, this interview into the hands of Mike Clayton because we've got a very special guest who's going to join you here, and I'm going to let Mike do the uh, hold the reins. Okay. Uh, um, I understand you probably haven't spoken to this gentleman for a long time, but he's a he's you know he's a very he played an important part in your history at some point in your life, and we we talk of course of Kevin Hartley, and I hope Kevin is sure. on the line to join us now. Yeah, how you doing? Heart the dart. Heart the dart. Heart the dart. How are you, my man? Oh, hanging together by a slender thread. <laughs> by a, by a little thread. Well, the last time I talked to you, you told me the same damn thing. Yeah, well. It's getting thinner. <laughs> it getting thinner? <laughs> well, well for, for, for those of you that never had the chance, which I guess is all of you, uh, Kevin Hartley was a, was a really tough competitor. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many times Hart and I played, but I think the record probably is about six to four in his favour. He could whip your ass any time. <laughs> Uh, well, it's, uh, as they say in the classes, it's only a matter of skill. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Dart, you won the amateur in '58. I'm not sure if this is. Yeah, it's you, about right. Yeah, you, know, you hear all these stories when you're a kid, and you always wonder if they're apocryphal or not. But someone told me that you determined that if you beat Devlin and won the amateur in '59, you'd turn pro. Uh, and, and 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 he beat you in the semi final or something. Was that right? Yeah, the 20th, yeah. What a bastard. Can you believe that? <laughs> <coughs> uh, I told you about our license, Bruce, didn't I? Yeah. Well, he was, he's, uh, he's, a, he's been a great friend of mine. And, I, you know, unfortunately, I decided to spend most of my time over here. But we spent a, a great deal of time together down in uh, Williamstown. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, uh, he, came, he came and worked in, in Melbourne in Melbourne for a while. He was, uh, he was selling plumbing equipment. That's right. That's yeah. right. For for Paro and White were the name was the name of the company. Paro and White. Yeah. And and uh, Mr. White was a member at uh, Commonwealth. At, uh, Commonwealth, and that's that's how I become a, a junior member there. Yeah. Even though I was older than a junior. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, what how how good was Bruce to to play against, and and you must be incredibly proud to have played a part in his career. What was that? You must be incredibly proud to have played a part in in Bruce's career, and how good was he at the height of his powers? Oh, he was uh, he was more of a natural than what I was. I was a worker. He was a natural. For those who don't know, Dart, a worker, you actually had a. Unlike Tony Gresham, who never had a job in his life, who was, some people might say, was the best amateur of the time, you were because you had a proper job. So you would go to Keringle every morning at the sun up and practice every day, right? Yeah, I, uh, I, I tried to maximise my practice time, but it's probably one of the regrets I had that I, uh, I had, a, had a demanding job and uh, I, would, I would have liked to have spent more time to find out whether I could have played the game a bit better. Well, I mean, it's, it's always the, the eternal question for amateurs who don't turn pro, but do you ever regret not turn, doing what Bruce did and heading to America and trying to make a living at that game? Don't be modest, Art. I mean, I've seen you play. I know how good you were. I mean, you were an unbelievably great amateur player who hit the ball like, you know, as well as anyone I've ever seen. So, Like a dart. Yeah, you know, th- th- this bloke wasn't just an average amateur. He was a... I mean, Bruce, you can attest to how well oh, Kevin played. You know, I mean, that's that, that's why he got his name. Yep. That's why he got his name. We were hacking it all over the place, and he was just whipping it right down the middle. <laughs> what? The, only, the, only, the only regret I've got probably is uh, it would have been nice to to have known how how good I might have been. You know, with uh, with, with, with you know with um, more time to have put into it. 
But I can't complain about my life. I've had a hell of a good life. <laughs> and we won't, hey, Dart, we won't tell them about our trip in 1959, though, will we? <laughs> when, you, when you were my nursemaid. Yeah, you have to put a screw joint up your backside. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to ask now, Bruce. <laughs> Give us an abridged uh, version. We, we went that. over to Johannesburg for the Commonwealth Games in 1959, and Kevin and I were on the... On well, it wasn't, the wasn't, the wasn't the prettiest wasn't the prettiest sight and wasn't the best job I ever had, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I... Uh, well, I think was Ackland Horman our general manager. I think no, the Justin manager Seawood, was Justin Seawood. Oh, that's right, Justin Seawood. I'm sorry, you're right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Ackland Horman was uh, in '60. Well, we yeah we were over there, and I was struggling a little bit, and I got uh, I got a bad case of the hemorrhoids. Yeah, yeah. And uh, remember the game we had with Bobby Locke? Oh yeah. Well, how about how good was that? Yeah, but. Uh, you were, you were astounded, you were astounded, Bobby Locke, with your putting ability. Bobby Locke couldn't believe you. You were nominating which side of the hole the bloody ball was going to go into. <laughs> and Bobby, we're talking about the best putter ever there yeah. as well, aren't we? Bobby Locke couldn't believe what he was seeing. Neither could I, actually. Locke was, Locke was a hell of a putter, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, that was... Uh, that was, uh, <laughs> that was uh, probably, probably the best golfing trip I ever had. Well, we also did something else on that trip. You remember what else we did on that trip? We played a little bit of tennis. Yeah. On Mauritius. Yeah. <laughs> the flame of Merlin Rosie was serving underarms at Ken Rose while it was coming back at me at a thousand miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was pretty funny, wasn't it? Yeah. Speaking of tennis, Bruce, did you ever know Lou Hode? Yes. Not very well, though. Okay. I did meet him a couple of times. I, but, I was having uh, breakfast with Paul McNamee like, this week, well, last oh, week. Oh, really? And, and he was talking about Lou. I, I, I met Lou in Perth a couple of times at the Hopman Cup, and what a lovely man he was. Wow, he was yes, a, he was, yeah. yeah. Now, you know, Kevin was talking about natural. How yeah. about that for natural? Yeah, yeah, he was He was the best player in the world for a, a long time, yeah. wasn't he, really? Yes, he was. He sure was. Uh, we might actually let you two have a chat off the air and... and and wrap it up a little bit because you guys have obviously got some incredible stories and I don't think we want to go too far into hemorrhoid cream on Inside the Ropes. So, uh, <laughs> Kevin, we might just let you go if you don't mind. We'll come back to you in a second. But, Bruce, um, just in wrapping up, yeah, just to hear you talk about these names, you must be incredibly proud to come through with that you know, magical era in Australian golf. It, it must still mean a lot to you. Well, yeah, you know, to, uh, I look at today's golfers and, um, you know, I... I I don't see the diversity that was in the game back in in my era. You know the different swings and the you know the different biographies of guys and where they came from and how they got to the tour. Uh, you know, it's it's all become a little uh, constant. I think is maybe is the the word, but uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a pretty good run. Uh, met a lot of wonderful people, played a lot of golf with some fabulous people. Are you still playing a fair bit? No, I'm waiting for uh, Clayton to finish the, the new course at uh, Shady so I can get out there again and we'll start to, playing. We'll have to take you out in the par three course and whip a few around there. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm, I, I, I try to play a little bit more in the fall. The summer gets a bit too damn hot. And besides that, uh, as we all know, as we get a little older, we get to our drives a little bit quicker and the club's <laughs> a little bit longer into the green and the Putts are also longer. <laughs> True enough. But I still love to play. I do. I love to play. I just don't play enough. That's all. Good. Last thing, Bruce. Uh, yeah. What does your win in the Australian Open mean to you? Where does that kind of sit? Well, it sits at the top. Uh, you know, I've had a I've had a great career around the world, but uh, you know, if if I if I look at how that career, you know got started it got started at the open you know it was nice to win the new south wales amateur it was nice to win the australian amateur but to win the australian open and uh, i mean i had to be honest with you i had no intentions of turning pro uh i came home from work one day and my wife was sitting with norman von neider in the in the rented flat we had in goulburn 
And I said, what the hell are you doing here, Norman? He said, well, I come to talk you, talk you into turning pro and your wife thinks you should. Yeah. So well, they I'm, ganged up on me. I mean, well, I mean, that's the biggest difference today was that you, know, you look back at the prize and I was, you know, look at Mc, Mark McCormick's annuals even in the 70s and you, know, you would win the Dunlop International at Royal Canberra and win $3,000 or something. I mean, <laughs> You know, I mean, it's hard to. I mean, you you get three thousand dollars for using a sand iron in a tournament now. Yeah, but, um, that's right. You know, it's just it's staggering. That, I mean, you must look at the money now and just be staggered at. It is. It is pretty remarkable when you when you when think you, of it. When it, you see uh, where it, it went. Well, I think uh, the first year that a professional golfer won ten million dollars was uh, VJ Singh, I believe. I don't remember the exact year, but I want to say it was like 2001 or two or something like yeah, that when he, when he had the, that hell of a run. He won eight or ten tournaments, yep. Yeah, he won, more, he won more money in that one year than uh, Hogan, Nelson, Nicholas, Player and Palmer combined. Yeah, yeah it's staggering. It's it's a, a, it is staggering. It's a breathtaking statistic. Yeah, it is. Speaking of which, well, Bruce... I'm talking with you guys. That yeah. was uh, nice to reminisce Great to chat, bit. Bruce. Yeah, it is. And just to remind people here before we let you go, Bruce, 28 wins as a pro, uh, New Zealand Opens, Australian PGA Championships multiple times, World Cup, eight-time winner on the US PGA Tour, 16 times top 10 in the master, in uh, major championships around the world, and, and we're really thrilled that you've given us so much time today. You're not only um, a great golfer, but you've, you've been a great ambassador to the country, and we really appreciate you sharing your moments with us. Well, it's just my pleasure. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to talk with you guys, and uh, I look forward to seeing Plate when, he, when yep. he comes back to Fort Worth. Yeah, I look forward to catching up, Bruce. We'll be there next year, so it'll be fun to, right. fun to catch up. Okay, buddy. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. The Golf Australia website is now the place to go to look up your handicap and so much more. Whether you're out and about on your phone or in the office trying to avoid work, just go to golf.org.au and punch your golf link number into the box at the top of the homepage. Who knows? Maybe that last round was just good enough to put you in single figures. While you're on the site, check out the daily golf results at your club, view our course index for up-to-date ratings, read the latest golf news from home and abroad listen to australian golf podcasts and interviews and watch video tournament highlights or tips to improve your game it's everything a golf tragic could want visit golf.org.au today the home of australian golf hi this is rod pampling anytime you guys want to tune in and find out what's happening around the world listen to inside the road great uh, great way to find out what the Aussies are doing your gears on Boys, uh, congratulations on that interview with uh, Bruce Devlin and with Kevin Hartley jumping in there. That was awesome to listen to. Hopefully people enjoyed it as much as I did. This, the recollections of his time with and against and watching Ben Hogan, I mean, that's that's the stuff you're, you're happy and you're glad that you've got someone like Devlin putting that on the public record. Well, one of the things that uh, we've spoken about at Golf Australia and Hazy's across this as well is that uh, doing these road to the open interviews, we're able to keep these aside, mm. and they're, they're they're kind of there for posterity, and that's a, a, a great example. Bruce is eighty years of old; he's as sharp as a tack. Yeah. Uh, to t- sit there and talk about Hogan being his friend, and and that you know, it's just brilliant stuff. And what a fine player he was, Hazy. I think oh. I, I was looking up the other day; he um, he won the Open in si- nineteen sixty, of course, but I think he was third, second, second. He lost to Jack Nicklaus in a playoff. At the Australian Open a couple of years later, when he after he turned pro, you know, won a number of times in America. I mean, a fine player. He's hit smack in the middle of that era. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It just come- went. It just went. Uh, it went. Nicholas player. Nicholas sort of Palmer. You know, mm-hmm. it's just there was about ten years there where they just completely dominated. And in terms of putting things on the record, I think if you're vaguely interested in in uh, in golf history and you're sort of you know between 40 and 60, you've probably got a fair idea of Palmer and Trevino and mm. Hale Irwin and this sort of era. But to, to be able to have someone to talk to, to take it back that next stage, oh, absolutely. is just priceless to me. No doubt about it. And if you want to know more about Kevin Hartley, just look up his his history, his record as an amateur player. I mean, and no wonder he says at the towards the end of the interview there, he would have liked to have known how good he could have been had he commit really committed all his efforts and energies into just being you know, purely his own mm. game because mm. you listen to the way Devlin you know, remembers him and it's with such great affection for how good a player he was that 
you know, there might be, you know, deep in that man's kind of aging soul, there is still maybe a little regret that he didn't have the ultimate crack at it. You know? I'd say he's fairly regretful of that incident in South Africa too, just quietly. Yeah, I know. You'd like to know a bit more about that, wouldn't not you? Not too much more. No, no probably not enough. <laughs> we probably know enough. Right, uh, other little bits and pieces. Um, the horse racing industry over here in Australia, I don't know whether people are listening to us internationally, but there's uh, unfortunately some uh, untoward activities taking place over here. Blake, Ian, you've brought our attention to the fact that beta blockers are rearing their head in the game of golf again. Is that right? This has been blockers a, for years. It's been around for a while, hasn't it? Uh, Etienne Bond, a South African pro, has just been suspended for 12 months. Uh, he plays, I think, on the Big Easy Tour, obviously named after Ernie. Else, uh, he was tested positive to a, a substance called Carvedilol, which is a better blocker. Uh, don't know the story as to why. You know, some people take uh, that sort of that sort of medication for uh, high blood pressure. Uh, the reason it's banned from golf is mm. because it, you know it's thought that it may help you with your nerves over the short putts. And I think Nick Price used them for about eight years for a particular ailment that he had and then uh, later on spoke I've heard Nick Price speak about it and he mm. said that it took the edge off his kind of uh, con- subconscious you know that it made him too low uh, Not- taking those so he stopped taking it but um, uh, that was interesting I mean drugs in golf I mean Rory McIlroy said I think last year that they don't do enough testing in his view they just mm-hmm. do urine testing they don't do blood testing so he was concerned about EPO in golf or uh, you know sorry human growth hormone actually uh, I do believe that golf is naive to this but it's a bit like the big professional sports in the states like baseball and that they tend to kind of shut their eyes to it a bit I mean there is drug testing in golf uh, look Dustin Johnson tested positive to a, what, mm-hmm. you know what I'd loosely call a recreational drug apparently so uh, there have been players that have been called Vijay Singh tested positive to deer antler spray that he was using for something else, and he's been suing the tour over that. It's a bit, it's a bit of an issue. It's a bit of an issue that sort of bubbles there. I think the deer wanted to sue him, mm, maybe. Well, I, I've got, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a really uh, bad disposition towards not being open and transparent with drug tests. I mean, it comes. Mm. I used to be a mad cycling fan. I can't even watch it anymore. Um, Baseball to me, I love. If I if I see Alex Rodriguez anywhere near a television, what, what, I turn it off. Doing? What are they doing? And, mm. and and I would hate to think that it's in golf, but you cannot be naive to the possibility that there are people who are cheating the system just by by virtue of the fact that the system's a dud. Mm. And if there's money around, people will Correct. always cheat. It's Correct. as simple as that. So golf is not above. No all chance that. is it above all of that. Hi, this is Sherelle McMahon. Swing Fit is the fun, healthy, social way for women to get started in golf. You'll learn the basics of the golf swing and how to putt over a six-week program and get your whole body moving through yoga and Pilates-style exercises. You don't need any golf knowledge or equipment. Simply turn up in comfy clothing and get started. You'll be surrounded by like-minded people and receive constant support. So get outdoors, meet new friends and learn a sport that you can play for the rest of your life. To find a program Near you, visit swingfit.com.au. Hey, I'm Catherine Kirk, and I want to encourage all the young gals and ladies of all ages to get out there for golf month on the month of October and go have some fun out in the golf course. Just a couple of uh, local bits and pieces before we wrap it up. Thrilled, thrilled as a Carlton supporter, and his father didn't play nearly enough footy for the Blue Baggers, but I got to know Frank Marcazzani a bit over the years and have had the good fortune of. Playing a game of golf with James Marcazzani's son down at Rosebud Country Club. I was so happy to see this kid salute in China during the week. He got a beautiful golf swing. I mean, he's got a beautiful swing. And if he can have eight weeks a year where he putts the way he wants to putt, then he could be he could be a player somewhere. He could be a player. Well, we talked about Justin Rose before, Blakey, being able to shut it out on a Sunday afternoon. And here he is starting the fourth round. Marcazzani, this is, uh, even and... Uh, with his playing partner and in, on the top of the leaderboard, and he starts awfully. And he's three down through seven or eight holes mm. and then played the back nine in five under, yeah, awesome. including an eagle. And you just think, that's a guy who's actually got the capacity mentally to get this done. So if his putter was working, he's a kid who could really make something of it. And he's come from a little bit you know, off the radar. He yep. hasn't come yep. through the, the, the increasingly traditional way. But full kudos to him. He was a sort of a sneaky second place at the Fiji International earlier in the year without getting any airtime. 
uh, and he's got over the over the line for his first pro win, and hopefully it's the first of many. He's starting to just, you know, you watch these players, and you don't know where their cap is, mm. but he's more often than not now, no matter what sort of tier level event he's playing in, he's putting himself in the frame at some stage, yeah. and you, you, you just, he's still got a lot of time left. He's still a young man by this game's standards. Mm. And if you get a chance, if you see him in a field of a, a Pro-Am or a Tier 2 event or an Australian, if you see the name Marcus Arnie and you're having a walk around, just go and watch him play for a couple of holes or watch him on the range. You won't see many better swingers at the golf club than this kid. So um, good, well done to him and you, uh, onward and upward. Do you think he looks like Leighton Hewitt? Um, uh, no, I don't. No? No. Okay. Do you think he does? Oh, uh, he was asked about it after his win okay, in China, right, right. and and he says he gets it all the time. Really? Yeah, I can't see it myself, no, but no. apparently he gets drilled about being, you know, an Australian sportsman. And, oh, geez, aren't you Leighton Hewitt? So, <laughs> right. Hazy, like- speaking of uh, Australian players in Asia, what did you make of the video of Terry Pukadaris <laughs> at the Indian Open? Oh, now, <laughs> Mari, are you onto this? Oh, it's gold. Uh, if you haven't seen this and. You need to get onto Golf Australia Facebook page and just scroll down a couple of pages, Blakey, and have a look at it. Terry Pilkadaris, one of the all-time greats. I don't even know. Do you want to try and explain it? <laughs> well, he, I, I believe from what I, I read into this was that he, he missed a birdie putt. That's mm. what really set him off. Now, I don't know what the lead-up was. Maybe he missed three in a row the, the time before. I don't know. But he missed basically about, a, it looked like about a 12 or 13-foot birdie putt. Taps it in for par, then gets the trusty Scotty Cameron or Callaway or whatever it was, three ball, and he hurls it into the mulga. <laughs> He's he didn't just he about, didn't about just twenty cobras went running. About twenty cobras went running for their lives. But I, what I couldn't work out in a video as he was whether he actually went and fetched it because he looked like he'd sort of gone. Okay, I better go and get that. I reckon he started walking towards the the jungle, and he's had to think about what might be in there, oh, and he's yeah, just no. turned and walked in the other direction. It's one of the all time great oh, videos. It's I, hilarious. I got a quick little Terry Pilkadara story, Andy. If we've got time. Uh, I, I had the good chance to caddy for him at the Surf Coast knockout a few years ago for nine holes one morning. Yeah. And we were playing um, down at Torquay Sands and he hit a ball in the bunker. I can't remember what hole it was. It's immaterial. And his ball went into a, uh, a foot mark that hadn't been raked. And he subsequently made a bogey that probably wasn't there to, for the making. And he <laughs> walked up the fairway before he teed off on the next hole and absolutely gave it to you. Which one of you idiots oh, is not was in that bunker and didn't rake it? And it was just one of the all time great explosions. I, oh, I love Terry. He's a he's a card. He's a huge unit. I, I think he's tremendous. That's great. We've, we've all uh, we've all felt like it, Andy, haven't we? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. More often than not. Mm. Um, Matty Griffin is the other one I wanted to quickly mention. Good, yeah. good friend of the pod and uh, the show, obviously, and um, kept his card. Has really worked hard. Japan, it's the back half of the Japanese tour, and had a great result last week. So much so that he kept to keep his card. Well done, Matty. Which is great news for him, and, and, and says that that'll mean that now he can come down and play the uh, Emirates Australian right. Open, which is only a couple of weeks away. Which is awesome, a lot to look forward to. Jason Day is having a baby. He is. Jason and Ellie Day are having their third child in June. It's interesting, Hazy, that they. Uh, Jason's already said he might have to miss the US Open because it's right around then when Ellie's due to have that baby. Mm. More it's a long way out to be kind of calling that, isn't it? <laughs> Well, it was a Someone probably, uh, probably Ben Everill probably asked him, put him under pressure to answer the question, so mm. you get the first, be the first with the Jason Day news on Twitter. Mm. Away he went. <laughs> uh, we're done. That is it. Hopefully you've enjoyed uh, the show as much as we're, particularly uh, the Bruce Devlin interview. Well done to you two and Clates for that. And one last thing, Andy, before you uh, hang up the mic. Yeah. Um, it's not 100% over the line, but next week we're probably 95 right now that we're going to have a chat to Gary Player. On our uh, road oh, wow. to the Open Series, sort of almost to wrap it up the week before we actually get to the Australian. If we can just pinch a bit of uh, the great man, the Black Knight, who, who I've time. discovered follows me on Twitter. <laughs> I, I'm just walking around like a rooster this week because how good are you? I, I, wrote, I wrote something on Twitter about you know we might have Gary Player on the show soon. Uh, I was responding to another guy who was oh. saying. And then Gary Player jumps in and says, what are you talking about, mate? He, did, he obviously didn't, he's like read his name there and didn't, didn't know what I was talking about. I, was, I had to reply to him and I said, well, look, we're hoping to get you on the show. And I think Hazy backed me up. But I, he actually...